Imagine a man who sits in a room. Slender spires of mist are released into the room. The spires of mist glide through the air, creating various shapes and forms. The man begins to interpret these shapes and forms. They seem to be giving him signs and signals. They seem to be telling him stories. These stories become his stories. This room becomes his life. These spires of mist are thought. The room is the human cranium. It can be accurately said that a man has not seen reality since he was a child. He has never seen the way things truly are. He has only seen reactions that have arisen from interpretations, and interpretations that have arisen from thinking. Descartes said, I think therefore I am. He was correct, but not for the reason he believed. Thinking indeed creates the man. It creates his image and his persona. It creates a story around him. It populates his world with characters on either side of like and dislike, friend and foe, family and non-family. His entire life is lived in conflict, subtle and dramatic, with this populace. Every one of these conflicts is but a reflection of his central conflict, the conflict with the image and the persona that thought has created. When a man hears himself speak, the voice that he hears is a false voice. It was created by thought. Put simply, if a man learns to live without thought, his voice changes. Its quality changes. Its content changes. Even the stride and the gait of the man changes. An awakened man is an entirely different species of organism than the unawakened one. The illusion that thought creates is so real that it is almost impossible to extricate oneself from it because the tool that he will employ to extricate himself is the very one that has imprisoned him, thought. This would be akin to pushing down on quicksand in order to lift oneself out of quicksand. In the world of thought, there are only problems. Even the good times are laced with problems. None of these problems have a fix, because each fix is motivated by the need to feel better. But this feeling is not sustainable, because the persona that seeks to feel better has been created out of thin air. He does not fundamentally exist. Have you noticed a pattern in your life? It is a tape-recorded Groundhog Day existence. You say the same things. Those around you respond the same way. You can predict what they are going to say. They can predict what you are going to say. This is the manufactured life repeating itself on an endless loop. Why is this happening? Because neither you nor they truly exist. All of you have been created by the hand of thought. Each person is asleep, talking to one another in their sleep. Awakening is not a spiritual luxury. It is the doorway to a true life, not a better life with more happiness. A true life, one which you have never known one whose qualities you are unfamiliar with. I will leave you with this. As you have read these words today, thought has perhaps interpreted them as, that's very interesting, or one day, I will have to look into this. This is because it has sealed the walls of your cranium with tar and caulking in order to make itself impenetrable to the truth. The illusion must be sealed from all sides in order to make it seem real. Man spends his life attending to things that thought created. He tends to a life that does not exist. And in so doing, he never experiences the one that he was meant to live. The motion one observes cannot be reproduced because it does not truly exist. Attempting to correct a flaw at the level of the flaw fails to understand the source of the flaw. Most pain is referred pain. Trying to modify natural actions enslaves a person to a life of empty instruction. Imagine watching a world-class golfer hit a shot, then trying to mimic the movement, but failing. Why? The world-class golfer feels he's not having good results, so he hires an instructor to help with his swing. By doing so, he seals his fate. From this point on, he becomes enslaved to this instructor. Few in the world will understand the answer to this question. 
the golf swing isn't flawed and in need of fixing. The golf swing does not exist. There is no swing. This fundamental truth has been completely missed by the golf industry. Like the self-help industry, it has built a multi-billion dollar business on soft and shifting sands. What is viewed as the golf swing is a combination of thousands of micro movements that present themselves as a symphonic masterpiece called the golf swing. It's like the perfect display of a plasma television screen. From afar, it's flawless, but up close, the beautiful image gives way to chaotic pixels. This is the same with a dance, a painting, or the decisions a master investor makes. If any of the micro movements are disturbed in an attempt to fix the whole, the entire structure falls apart. Once it enters a person's mind that something is wrong, he's doomed. He becomes a foreigner in a strange land, forced to forget everything he once knew, never feeling at home. By forever remaining incomplete and never gaining ownership of his talent, he becomes a well-practiced novice, but never a master. The world of business suffers from this disease too. How can a man learn decision-making techniques from a master investor? How can anyone succumb to following the habits of successful people? The fact that such things are taught shows how delusional the world has become. A master investor's decisions come from instinct, informed by experiences and decades of experimentation. Asking for advice or a method to make great investment decisions is futile. Mastery comes from a place deeper than skill or technique. The human body is made to respond and react, not to follow methodologies. It responds to perception, not technical manipulations. Mastery arises through perception training, not technique training. If the body knows what to do, it creates its own how. Books based on methods, techniques, or mimicry are not based on truth. They suit those who seek to be well-practiced novices, but are useless for aspiring masters. You will never become Warren Buffett or Tiger Woods because even they aren't themselves. They suffer under the weight of personas too large to manage. Their books, habits, characteristics, or advice won't help because to have those results, one must first have the factors that created them. Mastery of skill comes from understanding the source, a genuine desire to become a master, and an understanding that all pain is referred pain. It arrives from a desire to achieve permanence and to hold in one's hand what humanity has been struggling to glimpse for eons. Stoicism seems all the rage these days. It is touted and discussed at length in various facets of the modern culture. There are stories of Cato the Younger, who many consider to be the perfect Stoic. Cato, as it is said, would wear a tunic of an unpopular color in order to purposely invite ridicule upon himself. He did this in order to develop a tolerance for such ridicule and embarrassment, so that he may train himself to not be ashamed of superficial things. It must first be stated that any man who experiments upon himself in such ways has exemplary qualities. For rare is the human who spends his time on this earth, devoted to truly worthy pursuits. However, while this may make one more effective, more able to withstand difficult times, more robust in his dealings with others, and more suited for success. It does not allow one to reach his ultimate potential as a human being. I will explain. Let us take Silicon Valley as a case study, for it is the perfect confluence of great possibility and great misunderstanding. I realize that Stoicism is popular in arenas and areas outside of Silicon Valley, but let us it as a case study due to its unique position in the world ecosystem. There is a fundamental tenet in place that informs all those who follow philosophies, such as Stoicism and other things. And that is that if something is to be known or attained, it must be arrived at via a technique, a method, a hack, a how-to, a life operating system. It is a belief based upon rules, which is gravely ironic as Silicon Valley is built upon the idea of having no rules. 
It is humanity's beacon call against all things traditional, societal, authoritarian, and didactic. Silicon Valley is the home of the rebel. But this home of the rebel denies its very roots when it succumbs to methods, techniques, hacks, and philosophies. In effect, Silicon Valley hasn't distanced itself from rules. It has simply replaced them with fancier ones from the ancient Greeks, the Buddhists, and the Hindus. Stoicism, like all techniques and methods and hacks and philosophies, is based upon practicing something, training oneself to do something, and conditioning oneself to be a certain way. It is aimed at improvement and conditioning and betterment and striving. What is wrong with this? There is nothing at all wrong with this. But perhaps it will be more instructive to answer this question with an example. Imagine an eagle that manages to remain suspended three feet in the air for three seconds before it drops back to the ground. If you ask this eagle how it feels about this, the eagle would say, I haven't achieved anything yet. To which you might reply, I find this to be a great feat. You defied gravity for three feet in three seconds. You should be proud of yourself. To which the eagle would reply, What on earth are you talking about? I haven't even registered the three feet in three seconds. To me, they aren't worthy of comment. Do you not understand? I am an eagle. I'm made to fly. If we extrapolate this to human beings, the problem is that human beings are eagles who have never been told they can fly. And since a man has little hope but to become his environment, a human being who does anything at all is instantly leaps and bounds above the rest. But this does not make him great. This does not imply that he has reached anything close to his potential. It is just that those around him are so content with being chained to the ground that flight is nothing they have ever considered. It must be understood that this discourse is not about becoming better. It is about realizing one's ultimate potential as a human being. The one who practices stoicism is trying to get better at things. He is trying to improve. He is trying to become more of this and less of that. This is fine, but it isn't the ultimate. It isn't flying. The one who follows stoicism or any rule or philosophy or method or hack or technique is like the man who runs around the world chasing down every cloud so that he can wrap a blanket around it in order to stop the rain. It is an endless chase. For how many things can a man condition or fix? Understand this. There simply isn't enough time in a human being's life to technique or condition or hack or practice his way out of every significant human frailty. One might say that stoicism has made him better at uncomfortable situations. That is fine. But so what? He might say that he is less reactive than he was before. That is fine. But so what? A follower of stoicism might become angry or disenchanted by such statements. And he might, out of a fit of anger, say something along the lines of, then do you think that finding peace, freedom, or equanimity is equally useless? To which I would reply that peace, freedom, and equanimity are among the nectars of human existence. But there is a difference. And this difference as great as the divide between heaven and earth. If a man attempts to arrive at peace, freedom, and equanimity by way of technique, it will never become his way of life. It will never become his default. Never. Whenever you see this man, he will always be chasing it, losing it, finding it for a moment, then losing it again. One cannot technique his way to the glories of life. No matter how ardent a follower one may be, no matter how disciplined he may be, no matter how perfectly to the letter he follows a dogma, a philosophy, a prescription, or technique. He will never in his life permanently attain the thing which he is seeking. Stoicism may make one more equanimous, but never will it give him equanimity. Stoicism may make one better at making decisions, 
but never will it give him permanent clarity. There are, no doubt, those who will read this and wonder if such things are even possible. To which I will respond, a thing is only possible if a question is seriously asked. Thus, the Achilles heel of Stoicism is that it keeps one bound to a method. And in being subservient to a method, one places a ceiling upon oneself, a ceiling that was never meant to exist. Then, what is the path to ultimate human potential? The man who truly craves to know the nature of ultimate human potential will necessarily be the man who is interested in the truth. What he must first understand is that where there are rules, there cannot be truth. Where there are methods, techniques, hacks, and how-tos, there can only be limitations. Buying into such things is to buy into another's problems. Understand this. The thing that a human being is a legend at is precisely the thing that he knows not how he does it. The one who seeks the partial and the limited asks, what method or technique can I employ in order to get better at something? The one who seeks the ultimate asks, what are the things that, if I understood them, would propel me to the ultimate realm without me having to lift a finger? The limited man who follows techniques, tips, and tricks will likely not be able to bring himself to ask such a question. Why? Because he is inextricably tied to the belief that it is effort that makes a man what he is. While the man who seeks the ultimate is either convinced of or is willing to seriously entertain the fact that it is understanding that makes a man what he is. Naturally, the limited man will retort, I can understand all I want, but if I don't take action, nothing will happen. Is he correct? Yes and no. The man who understands will take action, but his action will be a mere formality. For once, one sees the strings behind the stage and the way that things truly are. The action is done before it is done. But the limited man of technique and prescription will rely wholly upon his effort and strength. And because effort and strength are as limited as his outlook, he will only be able to progress at an inch per year, which many do, in fact, preach and subscribe to. Thus, I would say to Cato the Younger, Cato, I find in you an exceptional man for you are willing to experiment with your own frailties in order to more easily move through life. But rather than an experiment of will and intellect, would it not serve you greater to employ an experiment of mind? Rather than beat away your tendencies towards shame in the face of public embarrassment by hammer and club, why not examine the source from which this shame arises? Rather than make yourself stronger in order to withstand it, why not explore the well from which it arises? For in standing witness to its genesis, its mathematics, its gestation, and its birth, it will no longer have power over you. The idea of hard work leading to success has been a universal and sacred tenet for centuries. But is it true? Does hard work truly lead to success? Is every hardworking person that you know a success? Or is their life full of disappointments and anguish? As is always the case, this advice is a reactionary response to laziness. Those who lack drive and motivation are told that they need to work hard in order to become a success. However, the idea of hard work has led to just as much frustration as has the failure to reach one's goals. And there are good reasons for this. Since childhood, whatever activity we have been involved in, we have been told to do it hard. Work hard, play hard, study hard, strive hard, practice hard. But it is often the case that success arises organically rather than by force. It comes as a side effect, a byproduct. It comes because the circumstances are fertile for its emergence. It comes when the time is right. It is not necessarily won by grabbing it by the throat. Often, however, we see human beings fall into the trap of striking a brick wall again and again. We see them attempting to force that which must be brought about through tact. We see them using muscle rather than sensitivity. We see them act through brawn rather than gentleness, aiming for success directly 
rarely results in success, at least not in the form it is envisioned. Then if hard work is not the secret of success, what is? If repetition and endless striving is not the answer, what is? It may be helpful to change our perspective about success and experience joy on the journey rather than frustration. What if we were to abandon the idea of success and failure altogether? Societal mores would scarce stand for this. Let us begin with a particular discipline, a craft, a hobby, whatever you would like to call it. Something that you love to do, not for purposes of success or fame or wealth or achievement. None of that. Simply something that you love, something that you makes you joyful, something that is difficult for you to stop doing. Then what if you were to give yourself completely to it? Learn everything about it. Immerse yourself in it. Drink it. Suck the marrow out of it. Forget entirely whether you will fail or succeed, whether you will progress or not, whether you will make it or not, whether you will become known or not. Simply do it for its own sake. Do it for the joy that you experience whilst doing it. And do it with every drop of blood rushing through your heart. Come what may, do it for the pleasurable feeling of time disappearing. What a feeling that is. Do it for the feeling that comes from complete engagement, without fear of failure or hope of reward. Can you do this? Perhaps you have found something like this, but you abandoned it because it was not financially viable. Perhaps you were told that there was no future in it. It is important to know something. If you can do something with so much engagement and with so much care that it consumes your entire being, there will be a future in it. In fact, you will within it not only a future, but also a glorious present. If you can give yourself entirely in this way to any particular endeavor, Success will not be some eventual reward. It will be experienced each and every day. And the ultimate success that you are accustomed to hearing about, that will be yours as well. Not necessarily because you wanted it, not necessarily because you secretly hope for it, but because it is the natural result. Success does not always yield to the strongest or the most robust. She does not necessarily give herself to the ones who call her name the loudest. She is fickle and mysterious in her ways. When you love something so deeply that you could not care less whether it leads to success or failure, you are on the right path. Success will not only arise, but she will chase after you like an unrequited lover, not because you want her to, but because she simply has no choice. Human performance is ephemeral, is because humans are ephemeral. The foundation of their performance is composed of makeshift pieces, gauze, and duct tape. For a thing to be consistent, for a thing to be reliable, its foundation must be impenetrable. Its core must be based upon the truth. Professional golfers play golf for 40 plus years, but on a regular basis, they seem to lose their technique. If you examine this with a clear and unbiased vision, you will ask yourself how such a thing is possible. Yet it happens every day on the PGA Tour. Tour players rotate in and out of the tour, lose their card, get demoted to the minor league web.com tour. One week they win, they next week they miss the cut, and they have a ready-made excuse on the tips of their tongues. That's golf. Actually, it isn't. That's untruth. All pro athletes are the same because the culture that they belong to is the same. It is a culture of physicality. It is a culture of endless lies. It is a cultural network of beliefs that have zero basis in reality. It is a wonderful example of an idea repeatedly propagated becomes reality. For years, I wanted to know why Tiger was so good, why he seemed to win everything. In actuality, he didn't win everything. He had about a 25% win rate, which is unheard of on the PGA Tour. And, as is always the case, nobody was interested in the question. There are those who will dispute this point, but they would be wrong 
no one is interested in the truth. There is something that must be understood about human beings. They have a far greater interest in sensationalizing than they do in the truth. They look for a reason to root and roar. They love to spout instant and emotional answers to fundamentally complex questions. If you ask any of the media, the professional coaches, and the industry as a whole why Tiger was so good, these are the answers you get. And these are the same answers they've been giving for years. And they're sticking to them. He was just better. He had more talent. His father was a green beret. He has that uncanny ability to, when he first came on tour, he hit the ball further than anyone. He started the fitness movement in pro golf. Things just seemed to happen for him. He hit his long irons high and landed them soft. And on and on and on. You see, humans are hungry to be mystified. And when they are mystified, they don't want to lose that sense of mystification. So they preserve their mystification in amber and keep it shielded from the light of the truth. My two boys have been involved in tournament golf for years. They are preparing for a career on the PGA Tour. As such, I wanted to learn as much about Tiger as I could. I searched for one book, just one, that demystified Tiger and told the truth behind his success. I should have known better. Why write a book that no one is interested in? It is headlines that sell. So it's far more profitable. Write a book about headlines and sensationalism. This is why the masses are so toxic to any society. They create a demand for the fluff and the sizzle, causing every industry to fall prey. The masses control the demand, and thus they control the supply. Tiger's foundation was based upon an Eastern understanding. He fell prey to the Western neon lights of instruction, and he paid a price for it. He has 14 majors now. And if he hadn't succumbed to the quicksand of instruction, I bet that he would have won 25 majors, even despite the turmoils in his life. I have invested great focus and investigation into Tiger Woods' performances. And the truth that I have unearthed is contrary to what everyone thinks. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, so I'll save it for the serious. Most professional athletes, businessmen, and the whole society at large lives at a fraction of their human potential. And this is because the instruction and the information that they receive is a fraction of the truth. I've decided to share with you select truths about world-class human performance. Things that the performance community across all of professional sports and high-level business coaching would not understand and would be outraged to hear. Practice does not make one perfect. It makes one mediocre. Weightlifting causes muscle fibrosis and results in a loss of touch and feel. There is no such thing as a mental game. Psychology is sprinkling baby powder on day-old perspiration. Meditation will do next to nothing for you. Positive motivation cannot hold a candle to negative motivation. The shot is taken before it is taken. No tour player understands this. But it is the key to consistency. If you aim, you will aim incorrectly most of the time. Aphorisms and self-talk degrade self-confidence. Morning rituals are largely irrelevant. Virtually 100% of team practices are a complete waste of time. They are no more contributory to performance than watching television. And they use valuable bodily resources to boot. They are done out of anxiety and to fill the time. Most athletes have lost before they walk onto the field. Deep inside, they know who they are. The athletic and the corporate world rely upon hope. Hope is one of the central foundations of their practice and their tournament play. The business world is no different. Hope is the single greatest strategy that is employed because it is the most emotionally invested and the most plentiful. A man who is hopeful will live in stormy seas for the whole of his life, no matter how talented he may be. The businessman who tries to exude confidence is tagged and discarded within minutes. The business team with a five-point plan is a poster child for mediocrity because human interactions are soft rather than hard. The way to a human's heart is not through strategy. It is through trust, and trust is never strategic. 
the CEO's pep talk to his employees does not have the effect that he believes it to have. The employees do not receive the words in the same way that they are spoken. And in truth, the CEO rarely knows what precisely he wishes to communicate. The corporate culture, even in the world's most profitable business, is as chaotic and mired in untruth as the world of professional sports. Businesses that bring in motivational speakers to tell a few jokes and speak a few motivational phrases about pride and teamwork are fundamentally unserious. The individuals who hire such motivational speakers are not world-class, for this is not a behavior of the world-class individual. Employees who attend motivational speeches aren't interested in learning. They are interested in entertainment. They are interested in laughing. In fact, if you watch closely, they will be laughing as they walk into the auditorium. They are happy about having the opportunity to laugh. They are interested in having a break from the rigors of their work life. And the motivational speakers are happy to oblige. It would be far cheaper and more effective to simply give the employees a week off. The CEO is the captain of a ship. And as captain, he should be the one who is most invested with wisdom. As the CEO, he should be the first one to see through the idiocy of motivational speeches. If he is serious, workshops are work without reward. Few will implement that which is taught. And that which is taught is rarely effective. More expenses down the drain. If a CEO wishes to have a world-class operation, he must be serious enough to discover the real problems. And this seriousness begins with evaluating his own level of seriousness. A company that makes billions, but isn't on a journey of self-transformation, is a place of low morale, status quo, and boredom. Man needs a mountain to climb with heavy winds and the prospect of the summit. Without engagement, a man is a bag of bones waiting to die, no matter how wealthy he may be. Human beings live catastrophically below their potential, and they have gotten used to acknowledging this and nodding their head at it, which means they don't actually realize it. No one ever says, yes, you're right. My house is on fire. Shame, isn't it? Can you please pass the salt? World-class performance begins with a world-class desire to know the truth, and it is only the serious human who is ready for the truth. It is only the serious human who is serious enough to stop wasting time. You've become very familiarized with it, haven't you? This voice inside your head, it doesn't necessarily speak to you, it just speaks. Even as you're reading these words, it's speaking. After every third word, you're interrupted. Whatever you see, you don't see in full. Because as you're trying to see, it's talking. The tape recorder in your head is always left on. The battery never dies. Those rare glimpses of freedom, bliss, and peace that you felt in your life were the result of the tape recorder accidentally turning off. It stalled, and you saw the heavens. It paused, and for a moment, you became free. In the temples, the ashrams, and the monasteries around the world, in meditation camps, in silent retreats around the globe, there are teachers and instructors teaching about meditation. There is chanting, incense, prayer, mantras, prostrations, posters on the wall, holy texts on the altar, tradition, ritual, ancient passages. Retreat into a cave for years at a time. For what purpose? To shut off this voice in the head. It is like the cartoon of the man who has destroyed his entire house after numerous failed attempts at swatting a fly. The Rinpoches, the Buddhist masters, and disciples are true seekers. I hold them in high regard because of the purity of their intention. But facts are facts, and the fact is that only a small fraction of even these lovely souls succeed in shutting off the voice in their head. One will naturally hear this and wonder how plausible it is if even those who meditate all day and follow years of ritualistic teachings aren't able to accomplish this task. That would be the wrong question. A better question is this. Why do those who achieve it, achieve it, 
and why do those who do not fail to do so? I will not enter down the road of modeling the behaviors of successful people, for success is a product of non-negotiable visions more than it is a product of behaviors. The people who achieve anything are the ones for whom the vision and the payoff is central to their existence. They would consider their life a complete failure if that particular thing was not accomplished. The pictures of business, entrepreneurial, and worldly success have been painted thousands of times, and thus it is easy to visualize them and be familiar with what the outcome will be like. But the visions of achieving thought freedom have not. So allow me to paint this picture for you. As I wrote this last sentence, I was rushed to write the next one in which I would vehemently proclaim that it is not my hope that anyone will stand before this picture with wondrous eyes. It is neither my wish nor my hope that you will imbibe it. I am neutral in this regard. You see, motivations are never actually created. They are always latent in a particular human being. And when the impetus arises, the motivation that was always there comes alive. I will paint this picture without trying to sell it to you. I will not adorn it with pretty adjectives. Although I must admit that the very content of the outcome may itself seem so compelling that it sells itself. I will do my part in painting the picture in the most matter-of-fact way that I can. Thought freedom is not freedom of thought. It is the freedom to think only when you want to think, and the ability to have silence of mind when you are not thinking. Thought freedom is to have silence as your default state, and thinking as a voluntary and utilitarian act. For all of your adult life, you've had the precise opposite. Have you not? When you need the car, you drive it. When you don't need it, it doesn't keep driving around the block. It sits quiet and still in the garage. If you were to live in thought freedom, you would have thoughts only when you wanted to have them. Thought would become utilitarian. It would be a tool. And thus you would only think when you needed to think. Thus, you would have all the great thoughts and ideas without the noise. There are great ideas coming at you every minute, but you only hear them once in a blue moon. And this is because they are drowned out by the mental chatter, the noise, the constant stream of involuntary thought, the tape recorder. If you attained thought freedom, the voice of the person you are speaking to would not only be heard, it would be felt. And in a short time, you would begin to hear the words he or she was going to speak before they even spoke them. Yes, you would be able to read their minds. As I wrote this last sentence, I did it as matter-of-factly as I could. I'm not selling you. As I said, if the claim sells itself, that's not my doing. If you attained thought freedom, then you would become what you see. There would be a union between you and it. And thus, you would see it wholly, fully, in three dimensions, and as if for the first time. If you attained thought freedom, you would never suffer an emotional outburst. I'll quickly give you a factual reason for this, lest you think I'm selling you. The reason that emotional outbursts arise is precisely because of involuntary thought. The involuntary thought produces an involuntary emotion this is what I mean when I say that human beings do not live their own lives, nor do they live the life of someone else. They live as reactive, bare nerves, a spinal and reflexive existence, to which the remedy you've been given is to take a moment to think before you react. Or you cannot control what happens to you, but you can control how you react to it. My dear friend, if you have not achieved thought freedom, while you are thinking about your reaction, you are just sitting in the car, which is wildly driving around the block. The thought is still not yours. It is not under your control. And while you may produce a slightly less emotional outburst today, 
it is bound to be released tomorrow, because the car has not been parked still and quiet in the garage. If you attain thought freedom, your work would become a masterpiece, because you would work without interference. You would, as a natural byproduct of thought freedom, achieve super concentration. It has been said, all of man's ills arise from his inability to be still. But what has not been said is, the inability to sit still is the result of the greatest disease of mankind, involuntary thought. Is this a panacea? It is in fact the only bona fide panacea in existence. Put succinctly, if you train yourself to achieve thought freedom, you become a living, breathing God. From the moment you awake, to the moment you sleep, and into the dream state, your life becomes divine. It is done systematically. For when you begin this journey to thought freedom, your mind will tell you exactly what you want to hear. This is a great pitfall in this oh-so-delicate journey through the snow-filled mountain passes with invisible crevasses at every corner. In this journey, the mind will come begging you to stop. And when it does, you will have ascended close to the peak. Then you will have glimpses of ultimate reality. You will feel yourself slightly floating as you walk, for your body will act according to its own intelligence, uninterfered with by involuntary thought. This involuntary thought is like a drop of red dye, which filters through the ocean of our entire existence. And then you will come to a point where you look around and find there are no thoughts. No matter where you look, there are no thoughts to be found. You can create them by thinking, but they are completely under your command. You have not only achieved the moment, it has finally become yours once and for all. What I've given you in this discourse is the actual fine print underlying enlightenment, moksha, nirvana, samadhi, freedom, peace, bliss, and liberation. Become trained to do this and you get all of the above for free. Simply put, this is the only thing we must achieve. For upon achieving this one thing, all needs, desires, pains, and miseries vanish, and one becomes a living God. I often look at trees. Some of the greatest ones I've seen are the grand sequoias in the Pacific Northwest, but equally impressive are the ones in my backyard and the ones that line the wayward country roads. It is not necessarily their age, or their flowering, or their size. It is their beautiful tendency to remain perfectly still. When a breeze tickles them, they slightly sway. And when it is quiet, they are as still as an image in a photograph. They are intensely alive, these trees. They breathe and they feel, as we do. And I've often wondered why it is that they are so still and what lesson I can learn from them. As the sun rises above them, they are still. As the cold hardens their bark, they are still. Throughout the unspeakable darkness of night, they are still. And as the heavens drench them with rain, they are still. What do they know that perhaps I do not? What have they learned that I have yet to learn? They have stood witness to wars. They have watched men die at their feet. They have acquiesced to the mischief of curious children and supported the traveler in need of a rest. Birds cover them in nests. Insects live in their trunks. Snakes rest on their branches. And squirrels race across their backs. Yet they remain still. They behave as if they were made to become a part of the landscape. They treat their life as if it were not their own. They exist as if existing were the greatest form of activity. I have always loved the idea of stillness. I practice it regularly. But when I see trees, it shows me just how much I have to learn. For I have yet to master this art that they have spent centuries perfecting. I often ask my children to look at trees. We stop the car, pull to the side of the road, and just watch. Just looking at a tree makes one still. Even as I sit here now, my fingers type and my hands are pliant, but the rest of me sits and watches. 
for I am moved by these great giants. They provide a profound sense of motivation. For what reason do we have to be so bothered by our petty little lives? When these trees have been subject to all manner of abuse and disharmony, and their one single response to it all is simply to remain still. What a beautiful lesson this is for all humanity, regardless of the circumstance, no matter the emotion. Be still. Through this stillness, we will feel what needs to be felt. Through this stillness, we catch a glimpse of all creation. The trees must have caught this glimpse. Perhaps this is why they are still. Everything I once believed was me, and everything around this me has a solidness to it. I feel the bones in my left forearm. I knock the desk. They are solid, but there is nothing behind them. They have no significance. They are only shells. I find myself here after years of wandering. I do not care to know where from, nor do I have ideas of where I am going. The wares that once attracted me attract me no more. The bells, the sounds, the lights are not even worthy enough to call unworthy. Man's greatest folly is to condense into a self. And as I, let us say, emerge from the self, there is a freedom from lifetimes of bondage. The self, the personality, is a burning ship. Nothing more. How silly to try to improve a burning ship. How silly. This discourse is moving slowly. There are great pauses between sentences, as if each sentence is a walk across the Sahara. The fingers seem to feel that the discourse has come to an end. Some mysterious force within me feels that the discourse has just begun. Perhaps this discourse is not meant for public consumption. Finding the moment is like finding an uncompromising emptiness. The mind peeks behind the curtain into the world it once knew, the tumultuous playground that is its sandbox. Man is meant to live as he arrived, naked, innocent, unnamed, and unadorned. If only he was aware of the fields of broken glass that he would soon have to traverse. If only he was aware of the storms he would have to pass through. If only he was aware of the raging seas he would have to endure. If only he knew that having reached the other side, he would find more of the same. On the other side of mountains, are more mountains. On the other side of storms, more storms. Even death does not compare to the hell one experiences once he creates an identity. There is a reason that trees have no names. Call them by the name that you have given them, and they do not respond. Buddha said that the source of all suffering is craving. I say that the source of all craving is identity. It is a misstep that one pays for for his entire life, and he never stops paying, compromises nothing in the face of resoluteness. Effort is nothing in the face of certainty. Choice is nothing in the face of inevitability. Wisdom lies in retreating from all things, not a mechanical retreat, not a forced retreat, not an intentional retreat, but an inevitable retreat. The retreat becomes inevitable when one sees with his own two eyes in all four chambers of his heart, that there is no longer anything here for him. It is a stage production with posters, props, and extras. Philosophy is for the man who wishes to partake in the very game that he philosophizes is meaningless. The sword must be surrendered, the armor removed, the insignia erased, not by you, not by you at all, nowhere is the only place a man can be free, and no one is the only thing he can be free as. We will begin with a scene from Oliver Stone's masterpiece, Wall Street. Gordon Gecko, the master investor, is explaining the truth to his protege and neophyte broker, Bud Fox. Bud asks Gordon, what about hard work? This is Gordon's response. What about it? I bet you stayed up all night analyzing that dog shit stock you gave me. Where'd it get you? My father. He worked like an elephant pushing electrical supplies until he dropped dead at 49 with a heart attack and tax bills. Wake up, will you, pal? 
If you're not inside, you are outside, okay? And I'm not talking about some $400,000 a year, working Wall Street, stiff flying first class and being comfortable. I'm talking about liquid, rich enough to have your own jet, rich enough not to waste time. 50, $100 million, buddy, a player. As for the sum of money that Gordon mentioned, it's important to remember that this was in the year 1987. Some will look upon Gordon Gecko from the standpoint of disingenuous societal props, such as morality. To this, I will say that if man had achieved peace in his life, he would never need a fabricated concept such as morality hanging over him. A peaceful person couldn't be immoral if he tried. The reason that we have the need for prisons, policemen, and watchdogs at every corner is precisely because man hasn't been given the tools to be at peace within himself. He hasn't been given the truth. The most important trait to be recognized in Gordon Gecko is that he figured out that what everyone was selling in his industry was a farce. And rather than get in line like everyone else, he found a way to make his own line. This is why he was one of the few who became a player, rather than a Wall Street stiff. What I have noticed over the years is something very interesting. People who buck the system in their own industry often fall into industry norms when they enter another industry. It is certainly this way in the game of golf. Powerful world-class executives who have actually invented industries by breaking every rule in the book. Yet when they come to golf, they hire the local golf instructor to instruct their every move. Where to put their hands, how to move their arms, how wide spread their feet. How does a man who is a genius in his industry allow himself to become a veritable invalid in another? These world-class executives play golf for 40 years and don't break 90. This is the norm. The golf industry now has space shuttle technology, radar data, launch monitors, 3D simulators, and even a robot that you can step inside that moves the golfer's arms in a particular way in order to hit the golf ball correctly. What is the result of all this fancy and expensive instruction? The average golf handicap hasn't improved in the last 50 years, not by one single solitary stroke. Any questions? I have not shared this story to many people. The first time, in fact, was a few days ago to a lovely young lady who is reading this discourse as we speak. But there was a swimmer who was in a slump for three years. He'd seen coach after coach, psychologist after psychologist for three years. But he couldn't place well at a race. He'd fallen off the map. All of these coaches had all the technical instruction in the world. I was asked to fly to Los Angeles to work with him. I'll just quickly summarize. Two trips, four hours of work. He wins at least five meets and makes the 2016 Olympic team and represents his country in Rio last year. His coach called and asked me what I did. I told him I didn't know. I just sort of got him out of his mind. What do I know about swimming? I can swim. That's about it. In fact, I must have asked him 20 times how many meters it was from one wall to the other wall. What's the take home message here? Write this down. It is never about the thing. It is all about the mind. It doesn't matter if it's business, engineering, medicine, pro sports, relationships, parenting, friendship, socialization, or anything else. It is all mind, nothing else. Let us talk about this ethereal concept called spirituality. The most important thing is to fall out of love with that word. Spirituality will not help you. Practicality will transform you. There is no spirituality. There is only mind. Whatever you do in your life, it's critical to be sincere. This too is for practical reasons. I don't tell anyone to be sincere because it's the right thing to do or because it's proper or healthy or just plain nice. I say it because if you are sincere, you will be free from inner turmoil. I'd say that's a pretty handy benefit, wouldn't you? If someone says, for instance, look, when it comes to the mind and to my life, I don't really want to be a player. 
I just want to get in line. I just want to keep my head down and follow the masses. I'm not really interested in getting anywhere. Truth be told, I just sort of like the orange robes and the incense and the 20 minutes of meditation. And I'll admit that I secretly like asking my friends how long they meditate because it's sort of a competition for me. Don't tell anyone I said that, but that's really what excites me. That's sincere. To me, that's very respectable. How can you not have respect for a person who is that straightforward and honest? I would shake this person's hand and say, it's truly an honor to meet someone as sincere as you. And I would mean every word. But if someone says, I really want to learn about the mind. I absolutely want peace in my life. I want to have an amazing relationship with my wife and my children. I want to feel what it feels like to be truly free. I'm all in. I want to be a player. And then they hire meditation instructors, talk about mindfulness, go on silent retreats, and hang an alms symbol on their rearview mirror. Well, the truth is that such people do not want to be players at all. I've never understood silent retreats. Why would you need to go somewhere to be silent? And why would you join a group? Why not spare yourself the torture and be alone? Isn't this more conducive to being silent? And do you really need an instructor to tell you how to be silent? You need an instruction for that too. Really? It's important to note that I am not the judge of anything. The results are the judge of everything. And by results, I don't mean the ones that you scrape the bottom of the barrel in order to find, so that you can justify the time and money spent doing something which deep inside yourself you know, didn't do a single thing for you. I mean real results. I've shared with a few people the story of my visiting a Buddhist monk who lives in a temple near my home. In short, I went there hoping that I was all wrong. You have no idea how badly I wanted him to shame me. I wanted him to say that he had achieved no mind, no thought, total peace, and complete freedom. Because if he did, I would have sat at his feet and learned as much as I could. We would share our experiences of the quality of no mind we had achieved, and I would be honored to have pushed me all the way to Buddhahood. I would have become his student for life. I am all ears for those individuals who know what I do not. For learning is a splendid intoxication. As soon as we sat down, I asked him point blank, have you learned how to turn off the mind? He laughed and said, no. I asked him what he was doing in this temple. He said that he meditated all day. I asked him how long he had been meditating. He said 20 years. I thanked him and left. There you have it. 20 years with nothing to show for it. Now the scrap collectors will come in with their barrel scraping. They will say, well, he probably does have something to show for it. Maybe it's made him feel good. Maybe it's brought him some peace. Maybe it made him feel more calm. Feeling good, gaining some peace, and feeling calm can be done in about two weeks. If you're going to spend 20 years, you'd better be a freaking Buddha. Because Buddha did it in six. Whatever is worth doing is worth doing well. Wherever it is worth going, it is worth going to the very top. Wherever it is worth reaching, it is worth reaching the ultimate. But rare is the human being who seeks the ultimate in anything. They are more enthralled by the out clauses. Tell them the story of Gordon Gecko, and they will say that Gordon broke the law through insider trading. Tell them the story of Buddha, and they will say that he left his children and his wife. But I don't want to leave my family behind. Secretly, they thank the heavens that Buddha left his family, because now they can use that as an excuse for not going on the journey. And by the way, no one needs to leave their family or their home. The truth is not for the faint of heart. It is for those who cannot resist it. For those who hire meditation teachers, ask them if they can turn off their mind at will. Ask the meditation teacher. Text him. Call him. Send him an email. Drop him a telegram. 
Ask him, oh wise meditation teacher, can you turn off thought, even for a short while, at will? Say to him, today, I'm not asking you for a meditation pose. I'm not asking you about Ida and the Pingala or the Sushumna. Today I don't give two cents about the Kundalini. Today, I have no interest in balancing my chakras. Forget the third eye. Drop the half lotus. Forget about watching the breath. Can. You. Turn. Off. Thought. At. Will. And see what you get as a response. The people who are reading this discourse are those who have become players in their own industry. I will speak to you directly. Yes. You. What you have demonstrated in your own industry reveals a rare sort of DNA, my friend. I respect you for it. I admire you for it, with all my heart and all my sincerity. For those who make you feel guilty for being wealthy, for those who put you down for your success, forget them. It is beneath you to cower and lower yourself to the lowest common denominator when it comes to the mind. If you became a player in your industry, you can become a player in this one to find peace every day, at least portions of every day, to be free of human conflict, to no longer feel the need to fight with anyone, to be free of emotional turmoil, to go on a journey in which anger cannot touch you, not learn to deal with it, not to have it arise in the first place, to be equanimous regardless of the circumstance, calm in all situations, to switch off thought like a light switch, and feel the natural curl of your lips as you feel the glorious and godlike feeling of floating in this beautiful emptiness, to become a player. Why in the world would you settle for anything less? <laughs>